So our speaker tonight is Steve Lawton. Steve has been a member of Dorset Humanists for many years. He's given us a number of excellent talks about economics. I think this is probably your third talk for us, Steve, or thereabouts. Um, and tonight he's going to explain the difference uh, and look at these two things, universal basic income and the alternative, which is known as job guarantee. So will you please give Steve a very warm welcome. It's happened. Detect I always have trouble with this pointer right at the very beginning. <laughs> oh, it's working, is it? Yes, OK. Look, thank you very much for coming out after a nice day when you probably prefer to be at the barbecue or, or relaxing after whatever you've been up to. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes on the a question which has hit the headlines recently, in recent mm -hmm. years. That's universal basic income, universal uh, and a job guarantee. I put in there universal basic services because universal basic services are what we're all familiar with already. For example, the state education service, which everybody gets. Uh, in this country, the national health service, which everybody gets. Uh, so those are universal basic services. Pensions, which everybody gets when they get to 65. So those are universal basic services already provided. Uh, so we're familiar with those. Uh, so I'm going to deal with the talk in this way. We'll start off with looking at why do we need a universal basic income or a job guarantee? What are the aims of the universal basic income? Then we'll look at the, uh, the pilots and implementation because the, these universal basic incomes. There have been experiments uh, around the world. We'll look at the pros and cons, that's number four. Then we'll switch to looking at the job guarantee. Why the need for a job guarantee? Uh, then how that's been implemented, how it's been created and implemented in places where that's been piloted. Then similarly we'll look at the pros and cons. Then after that, well, it's quite amusing in, in a way to look at the UBI proponents, their criticism of the job guarantee, and to look at the job guarantee proponents' criticism of the UBI. They often level the same criticism at each other, I've come to realise. Now, all this is about income, money, work, services that have to be paid for. So at the final part of the lecture, uh, we'll look at what money is, how it's created and how it's spent, how it gets into the economy. A, a point often neglected by economists, but known about by bankers. So, why do we need any of these services? Well, the guy who's very keen on universal basic income, a guy called Guy Standing, who some of you may have heard of, he says it's to slay eight giants. And these giants are all the problems of sort of financial capitalism, the market economy that we now live in. Inequality, insecurity, debt, with people having mortgages they can't pay or credit cards they can't pay off. And don't forget that in this country, debt, that's private debt, not government debt. Private debt is over 150% of GDP. In fact, David was telling me earlier this evening he thinks it's now reached 200. But in many countries, private debt to GDP ratio is 150% is or more. And it's not sustainable because sooner or later it has to be paid back. Uh, stress and precarity. Marxists used to talk about the proletariat. People like Guy Standing and the Universal Basic Income people talk about the precariat. That's all those of us who are living from one month to the next, not quite sure whether we're going to be able to afford and pay for what we, we need to afford and pay for. In fact, some economists have calculated that a, a large percentage of the population is just one month's salary away from destitution. So we're living on the edge. <coughs> Probably not those of us here baby boom generation. We're doing quite nicely, thank you. But a lot of people aren't. Uh, another reason for the UBI is this idea that robots are going to take, take away all the jobs in the economy. Now, if uh, robots take over, they won't need to be paid anything. So there won't be any wages being paid in the economy. Well, if there's no wages being paid, mm. 
who's going to pay the firms for the goods that they want to produce? So they, 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 there's a fear that there might be a total economic collapse if artificial intelligence takes over. Also there's a fear that with rising inequality and rising precarity that you get populist governments and perhaps neo-fascist governments like the head of, uh, I believe the head of the Italian government, the, the woman there is a member of a neo-fascist party and you get xenophobia and all that comes with it. So these are some of the problems that the proponents of the the universal basic income think they can help solve and finally of course there's something which is in the hands of the scientists climate extinction I don't really you're listening today on the radio but one European country has now had a drought for so long it's got no something or other uh, India is facing lack of food uh, climate extinction I believe is, is the major threat to us but that's not an economic debate the economists just ignore it half the time it's a scientific debate but the UBI proponents think they've got something to contribute to that um, whoops so there you are we're all familiar with these things food banks unaffordable housing job insecurity uh, unserviceable mortgages and consumer debt as I say these problems may not affect if we're lucky most of us in this room but they are real and they are out there Oh, unaffordable care costs, yes. And, uh, well, recently in this country we've got a brain drain where qualified people, the doctors we desperately need, are, are resigning and going to work in, in other countries where they can get more money. So we've got all these problems. And I just want to note that the universal basic income and the job guarantee is not designed to replace the health service is not designed to replace state education or for that matter it's not designed to make me lose my bus pass <laughs> the job guarantee and universal basic income can be added to universal basic services I've put this in here the black report health versus income because Many years ago, I think it was in 1986, my wife Maureen was working on, on health issues and I learnt about this report which was more or less buried by the Thatcher government, although it, it did in fact s surface eventually, that shows there's a huge connection between wealth and health. Low income, poor health, higher income, higher, better health. I mean that's a tendency, it doesn't always apply obviously but it's a broad tendency. Also, uh, those people who feel empowered and have got some kind of control over their life have much better health. So when people are talking about is the universal basic income or is the job, job guarantee affordable, it's worth remembering that it may well reduce the need for health services. It may well uh, help prevent ill health. I've put, I've put that in here, I could have put it at any stage during the lecture really. Right, this is Guy Standing who works at the School of Oriental and African Studies I think uh, and he's worked for the International Labour Office and he's currently, he's the founder of BEAN, B-I-E-N. That was the uh, Basic Income European Network but they've now changed it to Basic Income Earth Network because it's, it's global. These are some of his books uh, and he says that the universal basic income is designed to address specific problems and there's specific strategies. As I've said earlier, our share of the national cake is continually declining in relation to the share owned by corporations and if you like to use an old-fashioned word capital income earners are getting a lower share of the national cake those who have already got income or assets are getting a higher share and Piketty in 2015 wrote a book which you probably heard capital I think I've got it here somewhere but uh, <coughs> he annoyed a lot of his fellow economists because he proved beyond doubt that we were going back to Victorian and pre-Victorian levels of inequality and they didn't like the fact that he had proved that because he was one of their own he was using their own economic models to prove this fact so and it, it's based on the idea that the rate of growth in our income and GDP is, is 
uh, sorry, the rate of growth of interest on capital is bigger than the growth of our income and GDP. Don't worry if that sounds gobbledygook. The point is it's just rising inequality and, and rising problems along that line. AI replacing labour. This is a repeat of what I said a moment ago. Income equals expenditure. One person's spending is another person's income. There's no way around that. AI takes over, no wages, no demand, total collapse of the economy. And uh, so we need to create economic demand so that producers will go on investing and trying to sell us stuff. That's the argument anyway. I'm not saying I agree with it, but that's, that's the argument. So, right. So basically, heaven forfend, or if you don't like that term, David, <laughs> humanists deplore no middle class. When all the coal miners, I remember in, in the 80s or wherever it was when I was collecting money for the coal miners or 70s in Bournemouth, the chattering classes weren't that worried about everybody being made unemployed because it has never happened to them. I think what's happened now is that the Guardian readers and the economists and all the people on middle incomes, they're worried that their jobs are going to mm. disappear. So no middle class, good gracious, and uh, people don't like it. <laughs> Right, so for people to the left of centre, the advantage of a basic income is that it reverse, it, it, they believe it will reverse rising inequality, there will be no more working poor. Don't forget that a lot of people classified as poor in this country are working. Mm -hmm. We've got people working in the health service using food banks. So no more working poor and freedom from bullshit jobs I don't know whether you've heard of a guy called David Graeber who unfortunately died last year he wrote a book called debt the first 5,000 years he also wrote a book called bullshit jobs he was pointing out that uh, many many people feel that their jobs are just not worthwhile they, they sort of go to work to get the money they, they like for the job they don't like the universal basic income is meant to do away with these, these worthless jobs. For the right wing, and there are people traditionally who you would call on the right, who think that the universal basic income is a great idea because it, we can reduce or abolish the welfare state. It could be used to reduce or abolish universal basic services. If everybody's got enough money, then why do you need free state education? Let people pay for their education. That's more efficient. Markets always know best. And it's worth pointing out that uh, Milton Friedman, who, if you've heard of him, you'll know he's regarded as a, by the left, they think of him as a right winger. He was in favour of the universal basic income or a form of it. Now, at the moment, one of the things that happens when you give people benefits is that you give it to the poor, it's conditional, it's means tested, and then when they get back into work, their benefits fall because they're earning again. And you get what's called the, uh, what do you call it, the benefit trap, the income trap. Uh, the idea of the universal basic income is that it's not withdrawn as people go back into work. So you'll actually get more people wanting to work with a universal basic income rather than fewer people. So it's slightly counterintuitive. It will it also, it will reduce bureaucracy. Think of all the people sitting in public offices working out who to deny benefits. Mm -hmm. That's their job. The government's paying them to work out who to stop getting benefit. Things that are universal, you haven't got that bureaucracy sitting around working out who to deny benefits. They could be doing another job, something useful. Uh, sorry if anybody does work in the benefits office. <laughs> should have, should have, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's also uh, it's. You've probably heard that people who are in favour of the universal basic income think that it will make everybody more productive because uh, they believe that w when people are empowered to choose what they want to do, they instinctively become almost sort of entrepreneurial and again when I think about the uh, Citroen car club which I belong to and people posting on the internet 
all sorts of stuff about Citroen cars and exchanging information and doing stuff. Uh, w Wikipedia, it's all done voluntarily, I, I believe. Uh, human beings do like being productive. Uh, the weather, we'll, we'll come back to this, but this is, this is the idea that, that it will liberate us and we'll be more productive, not less productive. Uh, there should be no big tax increases, uh, no dismantling of the welfare state, and it should help fight against ecological decay. Why would a universal basic income help fight against ecological decay? Well, I think the argument is, is that at the moment, um, if you're not working, if firms aren't producing, they face bankruptcy and the economy collapses. So whether they like it or not, they've, we've got to go on growing and growing and growing. And the scientists, many scientists now believe that we've, we, we're finally approaching the limit, which the, the publication that was published back in the 70s, The Limits of Growth, that's finally coming home to roost. But if we've got a basic income, and we're economically secure, we don't need to be going on this, this ever, this sort of journey of creating ever more, ever more and more stuff and destroying the planet. I think that's the way their argument goes. Guy Standing, whose photograph I showed you earlier, he also believes that the AI, the uh, UBI, the Universal Basic Income, shouldn't be sort of juxtaposed with other benefits, that we shouldn't be making the argument just because it might help end poverty or it might reduce inequality. He thinks it's a basic human right and that it will create a more altruistic, more tolerant, more productive, more liberated, more feel-good, cooperative society. He's sort of really quite evangelical uh, about it. Well, what about the how do we define it and what are the conditions under which it's given? Well, it has to be basic. That means that those on low income it will make a big difference to, but it won't provide total security. It doesn't leave you not wanting to work because you've already got everything you want. It's basic. So what level is it implemented? Well, that's where the pilots have, have had to experiment. It needs to be higher than welfare, otherwise it is welfare. So does it replace welfare? I, I, I suppose partially. How is it delivered? It's delivered in cash or bank deposits into our bank accounts, free to spend as we choose. It's not like food stamps, which you can only spend on food. It's free to spend as we choose. It empowers us. It's regular, predictable, unconditional, and it's paid to every individual. That would, be a, that would make it really universal. It's not withdrawable. It's a permanent right. As I say, you don't, when you suddenly find yourself very wealthy, it's not withdrawn. There's no benefit trap. That, that's the phrase I was looking for earlier, benefit trap. Uh, but of course, then you get the issue of the migrant debate. So proponents of the UBI, under pressure from those people who think there's that, that, that this country is, is overpopulated. They say it should be quasi-universal. They think there should be a, uh, a residency uh, criteria for it. So that someone has to have been living here for some length of time before they qualify. So that makes it really quite quasi-universal. It's not a universal citizen's income, it's a universal residence income. So that's a, a possible qualification to it. Right, everybody thinks it's very expensive. Well, I don't want to get bogged down in this, so I'll just go through this very quickly and don't, don't worry about this. Let's assume there's 54, the adult population of the UK is about 54 million and the GDP is 2.48 trillion. Th those are ONS statistics that I checked earlier this week. Well, some of the costings that have been done show that it would cost £67 billion per annum to introduce a universal basic income. That's 2.7.9% of GDP. And £67 billion per annum, that's that figure there, is less than tax breaks, which are at present given to, for corporate subsidies, which are £93 billion. So if you gave a very low basic income, it's affordable. If we gave one similar to what they did in a pilot in uh, Finland, 
it would come closer to 5.6 to 7 percent of GDP if we gave every single person adult in the country, 54 million adults in this country, a, a state pension basic income which is roughly the basic state pension, I can't remember that I was looking at this last year, it's between 9,310 grand, that would be more 20 percent of GDP. In America, some economists have calculated that it would cost about one-third of their defence budget. So that's just putting uh, some, some broad brush figures on it. Now, let's look at what's happened where it's been piloted. Well, the pilots that have been done show that it creates slightly more employment, not less employment. It produces an increase in skills it leaves people with better employability. In poor countries where it's been introduced, or emerging economies, such as India, I remember one, child labour goes down, education goes up, they get lower birth rates. Uh, domestic violence goes down, you get happier people. So those positive results have been witnessed where they've piloted it. Where were all these pilots? Well there's been numerous pilots, that's just a selection. I've cut out a lot that I was going to mention because of time pressure. But th the famous one in Europe was done in Finland where they paid 560 euros per calendar month to 2,000 unemployed people. Now you'll notice that that's not a universal basic income because it's not going to everybody, it's just mm. going to a small section of the population and that's the thing why it's difficult to extrapolate from the pilots as to what would happen if you had it throughout the whole population. But that's how they did it in Finland and they found no fall in employment. Uh, if we introduced a similar one here but to the whole population it would cost about 15% of GDP. Uh, other interesting things in North Carolina, their Native American community, they had a casino and they took all their profits per year and gave it to the population. £6,000 per annum for the population. And they, that, then they got this kind of result. Education up, domestic violence down, all the rest of it. Uh, Indian villages. It's been very successful in Indian rural villages in uh, getting people into employment and improving education. And one sort of uh, outlier is in Alaska where they use their oil wealth to create a, a, a national fund, a bit like Norway did with its oil wealth, <coughs> and they've invested it and it yields 10% per year and when a Republican governor or politician, when they wanted to withdraw it, the population were up in arms. They can't get rid of it now. Alaska likes its basic income. Here are some of the objections that have been uh, put forward uh, against the UBI. It's utopian, it's never been done before. Well there's a list of things there <coughs> that had never been done before until they were done. So yeah. that's a non-argument, isn't it? It's never been done before. You know, women got the vote, good heavens, they haven't had the vote before, we mustn't give them the vote. That's a non-argument. Similarly, uh, it dismantles the welfare, welfare state. That's a straw woman argument. It's, we're not proposing the, the, the proponents of the UBI to dismantle the welfare state. It's an add-on. It's a replacement. Uh, it assumes that the poor just lack cash. And if you give them cash, everything will be all right. Or that disabled people with terrible health conditions, they just need more money. No, it's, that's another straw man, straw woman argument. That's not what the UBI is saying. If people require specific targeted help for specific conditions, they can still get it when the universal uh, basic income is introduced. Some people say, well, it gives to the rich as well as the poor. Well, I bet you those people don't think that their inheritance tax should be put up to 100% so they can't give money to their children. So, you know, it's rather selective. The NHS gives to the rich as well as the poor. And don't forget that one of the advantages of universal benefits is the lack of testing. I can't overemphasize the fact that testing is, is, is a non-productive activity for a human being doing, just sitting down deciding who gets what and being paid to decide that. And it also results in what economists call type 1 and type 2 errors. They like these phrases. Uh, basically that means that people who should get the benefit 
end up not getting it and people who shouldn't get the benefit end up getting it by hook or by crook. So a universal benefit, you, you avoid those problems. Something for nothing, I think we've just mentioned that. Uh, don't forget all the things we're enjoying in this room tonight, the electricity, the projector, the seats we're sitting on, our full bellies if we're lucky enough to have supper before we came here. We didn't create the technology or all, all, all these benefits, we've inherited them from a common past. So the idea that just because something is for nothing, we all get something for nothing every day of our lives. It's unaffordable. Well, it, I, I personally think it may be unaffordable, but we've already seen that some people argue you can just rejig existing spending, you know, uh, and, and it becomes affordable. It encourages spending on bads. That means sort of alcohol, tobacco, uh, gambling. Well, in fact, uh, the pilots that were done in India and Namibia show that those in receipt of basic income, they know how to make very good use of it. There's this idea that poor people are too stupid to know how to spend money. Exactly the opposite is true. If you've been living on the breadline, and you get the basic income, you will know exactly how to spend it. And academic research, some that Maureen you were doing, it always emphasises, doesn't it, that those, those in poverty, if they get extra money, they know how to spend it. Am I right? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> uh, there's the other argument that it reduces work that would be done. Well, again, we've seen that, no, the idea is that, in fact, it, people tend to move, do more work when you, they're given a universal basic income. The upsurge in migration argument I mentioned earlier, you, you give it, if, if you don't think migration is good, then you put a residency condition on it. But, obviously this is contentious, especially when we've probably got people sitting in detention centres now waiting to be deported, who are doctors and nurses who we desperately need. And why, why are governments raising the pension age? Why is France raising the pension age? Why is the Conservative government planning to put up the pension age in the future if, we, if there are too few jobs? Which of course raises an interesting question about whether artificial intelligence is going to take over our jobs. One more complaint about it is that uh, the government can manipulate it. Well, why not have some... In the old days, the governments used to reduce interest rates or give handouts before a general election, so they made the Bank of England nominally independent. Well, have a committee that's nominally independent to make sure that governments don't suddenly say, oh, if we, you elect us next week, we'll double the basic income. So you can probably take that problem off the agenda. I think this is the real problem. Is it going to be inflationary? If the extra demand that's put into the economy by suddenly paying people who are not producing anything money, but if that then increases supply and there's a sort of positive feedback loop and we get more people working, then it won't be inflationary. But if, if extra supply is not forthcoming, it will be more money chasing the same number of goods, which is tends to drive up prices. I think this is where more research needs to be done and it's very difficult because all the research has been pilots on parts of the population but not the whole population. Jeff Crocker thinks it can only work if there's a pool of underemployed or unemployed people. In other words, if you're carrying excess capacity, factories aren't running at 100%, they could be producing more than they are, and if there's people who, who are not in work for whatever reason, if they, that's called a, uh, that's when the economy is not running, utilising its full resources. So perhaps there's a debate here about what happens when the economy is at full stretch. Some economists, I'm not one of them, but some economists believe that at the moment, post-Covid, the economy is now at full stretch, there's a shortage of labour. Uh, so that, that means that this is a consideration. So that's, that's a brief summary up there now of, of the pros and cons. I think I've, I've mentioned those. One thing I worry about is this idea of human nature. Are we all natural entrepreneurs who will work for nothing? 
or is it very important for us that there's a connection between what we do and the reward we get? I remember I was in Moscow many, many years ago and there's this bloke who looked depressed as hell and I said, what's, who is he? What's he do? And they said, he's the, uh, I think they said he was the manager of the a Dolphinarium in Moscow. I said, well, sounds a lovely job. They said, yes, he's getting paid, but they haven't built it yet. <laughs> so, now, that may be a false memory, but that is what I genuinely remember. And I drew the conclusion that we need to have a connection between how well we do something and what, um, what we get in reward. So this is one thing that, I mean, this is a bit personal. I'm sure our other economists have, might think the same. So, second half, how are we doing for time? Oh, that's completely wrong. How, how it's, it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, about halfway? Yeah, yeah. keep going. It's keep fine. going. Okay, thanks. Uh, why the need for a, a job guarantee? So hit, hit, these are, ac what are they called? Acronyms that are used for the job guarantee. JG, job guarantee. PEP, uh, oh, I keep forgetting what that means. Uh, employment, public employment programme and ELR, Employer of Last Resort. The job guarantee is when the government acts to give people, th those people who haven't got jobs, it steps in and offers them a job. The job guarantee, public employment program. Now, I've got this guy up here because I met him at a, at a conference recently, he's really nice. Daniel Kotzer, Chief Economist of the International Trade Union Congress, he's a labour economist, and he did implement the job guarantee in Argentina back in the early 2000s when they had 25% unemployment. And I'll show you a bit about that in a minute. Then we've got uh, Pavlina Cherneva. She's very good. If you Google her on YouTube, you'll get her talking about her book. Uh, and here we've got two more economists. We've got Stephanie Kelton, who you may have heard of. She wrote The Deficit Myth. The Australian economist Bill Mitchell, uh, who created the idea of the job guarantee. <coughs> not, not just on his own. And then we've got Stephanie again with Randall Ray. Randall Ray and Bill Mitchell have written a whole new macroeconomic textbook. Uh, of realistic economics which they're trying to get into the universities. Unfortunately the universities get a lot of money uh, from the financial sector and large businesses and uh, it's quite difficult to change the paradigm that's been running for so many years. Why a job guarantee if, if artificial intelligence is taking all the jobs away anyway? Well there's a guy in Google called Frey who thinks that all this new technology and, and, and um, robotization it, it's actually creating new jobs so he identified 162 new types of jobs so he's sticking to the old story that when when a new technology comes along it makes the old jobs redundant but it always creates different kinds of new jobs uh, for the last probably since about 1973 the way governments have tried to combat inflation is by keeping a permanent pool of unemployed people. An unemployed buffer stock of people. That's how they try to stop wages bidding up prices because if there's no trade unions and people are in fear of unemployment then uh, that's a way of controlling inflation. But of course this mass pool of underemployed and unemployed people who've existed for the last 30 years in advanced Western economies, they're not doing anything, so they are, and, and the, the, the factories aren't running at 100%. In the 50s and 60s, factories used to run about 80%, 90% capacity. They'd always have spare capacity. But in, in more recent years, they've been running at much lower capacity. So we've got unused resources, unused labour, unused factories. The job guarantee is designed to put these unused resources back into use. It's meant to provide people with purpose and dignity. It's meant to provide a wage floor below which no one can be, you can't be paid lower than what the government is paying on its job guarantee jobs. Because if the job guarantee says, right, we'll pay you £15 an hour, no employer is going to be able to pay less than that. They have to outbid the job guarantee price. So it, 
it, it will force wages up, that's the idea. It's designed to reduce the share of the national cake that's going to capital and profits, as Piketty describes, and increase the share of income that's going to people who are working for their living. It's not meant to be a permanent job, it's a transition job. What this means is that when the economy is in the doldrums and people are unemployed, the government steps in and offers them a job. When the, government, when the, the economy picks up and there's more jobs, then they get taken away from the transition job and into employment in the private sector. So this is not an argument for a state-run Soviet economy. It's meant to help the private sector, not hinder it. It doesn't compete with state jobs. The state jobs will still be there. They will get first dibs. So these jobs need to be valuable but elastic. But elastic, it means that they can disappear and they can expand. When, the, when, the, when we're facing unemployment, a business downturn, the jobs will expand. When things take off, they will contract. That's the idea. And the key point of the job guarantee is it's been designed to control inflation by using an employed buffer stop instead of an unemployed buffer stop, which means that resources are used more efficiently and it will cater for the business cycle. So what's a buffer stock? A bu did I say buffer stop? I meant buffer stock. So a, a buffer stock, do you remember the wine mountains and butter mountains in the EU? Those were buffer stocks. So what, what happens with a buffer stock is that you, you control the amount of stock that's available by stepping into the market and buying and selling it to achieve the price level that you want. So if, there's, if the farmers are saying the price of butter is, is going down, it's not worth us producing it, you pay them more. Then when, there's too, when, they're, when you're paying them so much they're producing too much butter, you put, a, you put a cap on the top of it. So you intervene in the market to control uh, how much is being produced by controlling the price. And that's where that Australian economist I showed you got the idea of the buffer stock. Because when he was in Australia as a youth, he used to drive along and his dad would show him, I think it was big warehouses of, it was either wool or wheat or something. He said, what are those big stocks of stuff. He says, that's, that's our buffer stock maintaining the price of whatever commodity it was. I can't remember if it was wheat or, 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 or wool. So yeah, wine lakes and butter mountains. Now as I said earlier, since 1980s the governments have been using a buffer stock, but it's a buffer stock of unemployed people. They always ensure that there's plenty of people who would like to work but who can't work, or alternatively they may ensure that there's people who are doing part-time work but can't find full-time work, who would do full-time work if they could, but they're stuck in part-time work. They have an unemployed or underemployed buffer stock. The reason why governments do this is because they've been led to believe by neoclassical economists that there is a NAIRU, N-A-I-R-U, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. I have a job remembering that, but what that means is they believe if unemployment goes above a certain amount, there will always be inflation. Now, the problem is that for the last 15 years or more, this relationship, this correlation between inflation and unemployment has completely broken down. So there's no statistical evidence that it's operating. Economists continually alter what the natural rate of unemployment is. They call it the natural rate of unemployment is the rate that has to be there for the government uh, not to face inflation. It's completely broken down, but all the economic, macroeconomic textbooks still teach it as if it's true. So, what the job guarantee does, it sets the price the government pays for labour as an employer of last resort, and as I said earlier, it's counter-cyclical. As the economy expands, the jobs, uh, the JG jobs contract, and if the economy contracts, the job guarantee jobs expand. And, you know, so when the economy expands, government spending falls. When the economy contracts, government spending increases. So the government acts as a, as a counter-cyclical balancing uh, measure. I think the JG faces the same problems as the UBI in terms of 
do you sort of set about trying to target it at certain, <coughs> certain parts of the population? Who do you give it to? Who deserves it? Who doesn't? Do you give it to people of certain gender? Do you target it at social groups, ethnicity, location? Well, <coughs> I think a lot of proponents of the job guarantee and the UBI would say, maybe not. Let's take the advice of Alexander Orlov and William of Ockham. William of Ockham was, I think he's a, 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 four, a 14th century uh, priest, was he? Or, I think he was a monk, yeah. yeah. He, he, he gave, 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 gave us the term Ockham's razor. And this is the idea that the simple solution with the fewest assumptions is often the most efficient and the most powerful solution to a problem. It's the simple solution that's best. You just offer the job to anyone who turns up. Mm. If nobody shows up, it means you're operating at full employment. The government sets the price, it's just a public option in the labour market. And it's for those who are able to work. As I said before, if people aren't able to work because of some health problem, they're not left, on the, they're not left to suffer. There will be universal basic services as necessary for them. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in his New Deal, we've probably all heard of that, I certainly heard of it when I was a kid or a teenager, uh, he implemented basically a job guarantee, a public employment program. Martin Luther King uh, campaigned for it with the civil, in the days of the civil rights movement. <coughs> but nevertheless, providing a public job for everybody, the government doing it, it does require coordination. Uh, it does require the government to work with regional and local government, charities, voluntary organisations, trade unions, quangos, and it can be seen as a problem. But Daniel Costa, who I told you earlier, he sees it as a challenge and they managed it in Argentina where they had 25% unemployment. Roosevelt managed it. The American New Deal lasted for eight years employing 8.5 million people. Australia has done it I think with the National Railroad offering jobs as an employer of last resort. In all these countries here there's been forms of job guarantee uh, at various times. In India quite recently 2005 they had the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act uh, public works projects in rural areas for any adult there. And then coming back to Daniel, the guy I was talking about, the Argentinian guy, they had the Hefes experience. Hefes, this is the bosses. It's the bosses, female and male bosses of households. And they offered it 20 hours work, 75% of the minimum wage. And they worked with the I was just referring to, the uh, regional local government communities, workers unions, NGOs, etc. They set up councils looking for what projects in the community would be useful. Mm. And those are some of the things they came up with. The uh, quite an assortment of things there. Bakeries and cake making proved very popular with, 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 with unemployed women. And uh, in fact, in Argentina, two thirds of the beneficiaries were women. So there is a, there's some gender implications in terms of the inequality between the sexes uh, in terms of the job guarantee. St oh, Steve, I was just going to ask if you could read out some of those things on the. These ones? <coughs> yeah, just sure. quickly read them out. Yeah. Community kitchens, cleaning parks, schools, and hospitals, gardening, bricks and tile production, which surprised me. Pavement repair, communal bakeries. Those are some of the things that were introduced uh, where they set up guaranteed jobs in Argentina. So now let's look at the those who believe in universal basic income. They don't like the job guarantee at all. They think it's a load of nonsense. Why work hard if your job is guaranteed? Well, that's a bit of a straw man argument again because the only job that's guaranteed is the job guaranteed job. All the other jobs in the economy <laughs> you still have to work if you want the wage that they pay. Uh, if, if you're given a subsidy as a boss 
to pay an employee, why would you try and make your company more efficient by introducing new technology when you can make the same profit because the, gump, the, gump, the job guarantee, there's a, the, the government is subsidising your, your business? That's not what the job guarantee does. It doesn't subsidise private companies. It's a public employment programme. <coughs> Uh, it ignores the need for frictional unemployment. You've probably heard of this. The idea is that in an efficient economy, when, when we leave one job, it's not a good idea to immediately jump into a next job, however ill-suited you are for mm. it. There should be what's called frictional unemployment. Time taken searching for the job that's right for you. That there's nothing in the job guarantee that says people can't spend time looking for a job and getting one that's appropriate. People say, oh, it will dismantle the welfare state. It appeals to the political right wing. Well, this is a political issue. People like Milton Friedman and right-wing free marketeers, they might want to introduce a job guarantee to get rid of the welfare state. But it, it doesn't have to do that. And mo most of the proponents of the job guarantee certainly don't want it to do that. It will cause wage push inflation. Well, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But it's meant to be a buffer stock. It's meant to stabilise prices. Uh, Will it, be, will it have a stigma attached? Mm -hmm. Universal basic income people are very keen to point out that we all do the, the job we don't want for the money we do want. They're keen to point out that in the Global Workplace Survey, 150 countries only... Oh, it's missing. I've, I've blocked it out with a picture, but I think it was only um, 40... Yeah, 15% are, are happy with their job. It's 15%. The highest happiness with jobs, according to that survey, was 40% of us are happy with our jobs. So they, th they think jobs are a form of wage slavery based on a kind of outdated work ethic. Jobs involve a uh, servant-master relationship. Mm. The, the JG response is, no, this is nonsense. Uh, we know from numerous surveys that when there are fewer jobs, when unemployment is higher, you get higher rates of suicide, higher rates of ill health. So they say, no, jobs aren't a form of slavery, they're healthy for our mental health, they're good for us. The JG needs to be higher than welfare. Uh, you experiment with the wage level, you get it right. As I said earlier, if nobody's queuing for your public sector job, you've set it too low. Uh, it must be below public sector wages, otherwise people won't transition into full-time public sector jobs or into the private sector. So it doesn't compete with the, the public sector jobs. And now we have the job guarantee critique of the universal basic income. Universal basic <coughs> income is something for nothing. It's boring. You won't get any people working. Do you remember Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome? K. Jerome? He said that uh, there's no fun in doing nothing when you have nothing to do. But the point about the uh, universal basic income is it gives you a basic income but not a sufficient income. It's not meant to replace, you know, it's not, you don't live a life of Riley on it. It removes the need for work and hence the value of the currency. Now, this is a more important criticism, I think. Uh, we'll see in a minute that the reason why a currency has value is because people have to work to get it. If the currency doesn't have value, we wouldn't be able to have state education or any public infrastructure projects, any roads. The currency has to have value. UBI, say the job guarantee people, will remove the need for work. It will therefore be inflationary. Workers would, firms will have to rage, sorry I got it the wrong way around, uh, inflationary, which way am I going here, yes, Work, firms will raise wages. The thing is both sides say this about each other, that's what I'm getting confused. The JG says the UBI is inflationary and the UBI people say the JG is inflationary. But I do think that if uh, the labour supply falls due to a lack of people working because they've all been given a basic income, then there may well be inflationary pressures. Warren Mosler, he's a, he used, he's a former banker 
who, who, who works with Bill Mitchell and some of those economists I've told on, on a thing called modern money theory. He says, if you don't have anything to earn in your currency, the currency will be worth nothing. The currency will collapse. The JG says that uh, the UBI doesn't produce unionised jobs, doesn't provide decent health care, it doesn't challenge the banks, it doesn't challenge inequality, it leaves all those tiny number of people exerting great economic power over us, it leaves them all in position, and it points out that Milton Friedman was in favour of the UBI. So how do the UBI people respond to that? when they look at the, their experiment in Finland. Well, they would say that it makes people happier, it slightly increases jobs, but the point is they only offered it in Finland to the unemployed. And they, they had two target groups, so many thousand unemployed people who they gave the universal basic income to, and another group of unemployed people who they didn't give it to. For me, that's not really a universal basic income experiment. But it might be something to build on. Then, of course, there are problems. Will the universal basic income happen? Lots of people are talking about it. Well, in the EU, when Finland did it, they had big problems because you have to get the EU, every country in the EU, to agree to it. They managed to agree to these small experiments, but I can't see the whole of the EU agreeing to it. I think we might, you know, we would have the power to do it here because we're no longer part of the EU if we chose to. But, you know, all those countries, I don't think it's feasible politically. Uh, they need strong, committed proponents to get a, a dramatic change through. Cheap support, you might go up to people and say, look, we're going to give you two, 200 pounds a week universal basic. Are you in favour? Oh, yes. Then you say, well, you're going to have to put up taxes to pay for this. Oh, no. <laughs> so support can evaporate very easily. We've got the uh, administrative challenges, and we have to change the cognitive paradigms that people have. We're all very much stuck, certainly in my mind. It's very difficult to think that if we just pay everybody for not doing anything, that an economy can function. But that's my prejudice, perhaps. Uh, for the general public, it depends on framing. I've just mentioned that. Depends how you frame the question, the answer that you get. Like in opinion polls, you can ask the same question in a different way and you'll get a different answer. Now, when I was researching this, in one of these books on universal basic income, it said, money is a mystery. It's shrouded in a mystery. Nobody understands it. It's beyond the scope of this book. I thought, how can you be writing seriously about introducing a universal basic income if you don't understand what money is? Mm. It should be central to the scope of your book. So I think this is where I'm going to try and explain a charterlist theory of money. This theory of money was, uh, well, it's been around for centuries, but it was formulated in its modern form by a guy called George Friedrich Knapp in about 1905, when he said that money has never been a commodity. It did not come about through exchange and barter. And David Graeber, who I mentioned earlier, if any social historian, any anthropologist will tell you there is no evidence that money came about through people exchange and bartering. People exchange and barter when they haven't got money. Money does not ex emerge from exchange and barter. Money comes from the state. Uh, the government is a currency issuer, not a currency user. The government instructs the central bank to send payments to us through our commercial banks. So when, when we get our state pension, the government tells the central bank it makes a payment to our bank in what's called bank reserves. And then once our bank has got those bank reserves from the central bank, it pays us our, it puts a deposit in our account. That's how money is created, under government instruction. When the Republican Ron Paul was arguing in the United States that the, the, the American pension system had run out of money, he, he said to Alan Greenspan, Isn't, you know, aren't we going to run out of money? We can't afford this anymore. And Alan Greenspan, to his credit, 
said actually no, we can create as much money as we want. We do it on our keyboards, on our central bank computers. And Ron Paul was, was, was shattered. He didn't, didn't want to hear that from Alan Greenspan. Uh, so governments spend and tax. They do not tax and spend. None of us here in this room can create money. If we do, we're counterfeiting. And in the old days, people used to be shot or branded or thrown in prison for counterfeiting. You can't tax, we all know we pay tax in money. Where does that money come from? We don't create it. It is created by government, as we'll see in a minute. Government spend and tax. First they spend, then we have the money, and once we've got the money, we can give it back in tax. I just want to make one provision about all this. I believe that with a universal basic income or a job guarantee, and this British businessman who's written eight books on economics, John Mills, this is his latest one, Why the West is Failing, he believes that these policies are not practical when we have an uncompetitive exchange rate. What that means is if we start increasing demand in this economy and giving people more money to spend, firms won't step in and start producing new stuff because the Chinese firms, the Vietnamese firms, the Singaporean firms will all be doing so more cheaply and more efficiently. So I, I would just, don't need to focus too much on that now, but I'll just keep that in your mind. So, the process of money creation, that, that, that's the quote, that's what this book said. I thought, that's crazy. So, what is money? Now, we're going to try and do, how, how long have I taken? Um, nearly an hour. Oh shit. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, I did it in 45 minutes when I rehearsed this afternoon. Oh shit, you should have told me I could have gone... Yeah. <laughs> don't, Sorry, don't worry, don't I, I apologise, I've, I've gone on too long. Let's just, do a, let's just end with a little simulation. Right, this is what money, how money is created. The government wants to provision itself. This could be King Croesus, 564, whatever it was, BC in ancient Greece. It could be uh, King Offa in, in, in the medieval England. Any kingdom or government or authority which wants to have an army, it wants to have prison officers, it wants to have people giving it food, it wants to be able to govern, what it does is it creates a currency and it, it says, we're going to tax you. It imposes a tax liability. You have got to pay us this tax. People say, well, how are we going to pay you the tax? We haven't, we haven't got anything to pay you with. They say, we will give you the tax credits if you work for us. So, John, you've got some tax credits in your pocket, haven't you? Yeah. Nigel, can you get out your tax credits? So, the king, the authority, the government, or even the church, it decides what to call its currency. This currency tonight is called Lieblings, right? And it says, at the end of the year or whatever, you've got to pay us, every single one of you, let's imagine it's a poll tax, you've got to pay us one Liebling. Well, we haven't got any. Okay, we'll give you some Lieblings if you work for us. So Nigel now is an agent of the government, John is an agent of the government. He will give you Lieblings if you offer to do some work for him. So can you get up and try and see if you can get people to work for you? Now don't forget, <laughs> the thing is, you, the government, this is a government, right? It may be quite ruthless. If you don't pay your taxes, you're goners, right? <laughs> you have to pay your taxes. The this is the government. Can you please make sure that if you sell something to the government, you get two Lieblings. The government has to give you two Lieblings. Two Lieblings? Yes. Anything they sell you, you give them two Lieblings. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the allowed to Well, you give them two. You've underpaid them. This is a generous government. It's going to give two Lieblings. Has anybody not got any tax to pay? Have you all got some, some money in your hands? No. Where well, you're going to no. get shot for not paying your tax. Can you please offer to pay the government, to do some work for the government, oh, to get yeah, your Yeah, I'll do some work for you. Whatever yeah. you want me to do, I'll do it, yeah. 
I'll uh, sweep the streets, oh. anything. Where, yeah. Where's Nigel gone? Mm. Oh, there he is. Oh. Let's have some more leave. This is, you know, imagine it in real life. You, you have to pay your tax. The population doesn't have any choice. This is coercion. So please, do some work for the government. You could be selling the potatoes. You could be... Would you like a leaveling? Do you have to Yes, I mean, the though. people who are potato producers, well, the government will something. say, well, we want some potatoes. Sell your body. <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't got the money he yet. He, he yeah, well, let's come to that in a second. He worked for you. You'll work for me, we. I will. <laughs> You're a government official. Okay, you should. I'll, I'll work for you. Bruh. Has anybody on this side got any money to pay their tax? Well, so imagine you're gonna, you're gonna. I don't know. What do you want to? What's your trade? Well, a bit of this and a bit of that. Okay, so your, the government wants a bit of this and this and that, and so they'll give you two Lieblings. Okay, any more, any more people who need some currency? Right. I'll, I'll do three Lieblings. <laughs> the government isn't paying three Lieblings. The government is the sole issuer of the currency. Right, can you put your hand up if you haven't got any Lieblings? Right, I think the government needs to employ a few sure, more let's, people. Let's give this to a, a Liebling, there we go. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> you can't pay your taxes in euros, the government won't accept it, John. You haven't got any money yet. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> there has to be an agreement between France on the rate of exchange, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Right. Okay. So the government can be generous, can't it? And give give some some euros. Right. Now. So all those of you who've got euros, uh, who've got Lieblings, you are government workers, right? You're state employees. Now there's a whole lot of people in the room, that's those of you who haven't got Lieblings, who are not state employees. Mm. What are you going to do to pay your tax? Don't have any tax liability. Everybody has been given a tax liability, it's a poll tax. What are you going to do to pay your tax? Um. Get yes, offer to work for the people who've got some money. Offer uh, to work for the state employees. So, so those of you who've now got two Lieblings, can you buy stuff? Because you, you, you've got the money because you work, but you haven't got your potatoes. You have, can you buy stuff from the people who haven't got any money? Okay, okay don't, don't do anything then. You, <laughs> Well, maybe some who hasn't got any leavings will want to provide you with some, some widgets, some goods or services. Right. So, so what, what's happened there? <laughs> What's happened is that the government has created a market economy. Mm. Because it introduced a currency, it introduced a tax credit that can be paid in tax, it gave it to its workers, and then suddenly everybody else is unemployed. They, they're unemployed in the sense that they haven't received the tax credit which they need to pay the taxes and I was going to ask John to be the tax man standing at the door with this gun. You can't... You... Yeah. Yeah. In, in southern Africa, in Nepal, when the, when the uh, Africans wouldn't accept the currency, they burnt down their tax, they burnt down their huts. That's how they imposed the British currency in southern Africa. Mm. There's been various methods used throughout the centuries, but the governments that want to introduce a currency, they're ruthless in implementing the tax. Now, we're going to have the tax collectors now going to come round. Everybody has to, has to uh, pay their poll tax. Now, can you, can you hand in your taxes to uh, David, <laughs> John, I'll take you. To David and uh, <laughs> Nigel? Are you the tax collector now? Yeah, I'm the tax collector. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Just one. <laughs> yeah, I'll take some commission. <laughs> Just one. Don't want to get yeah. shot. <laughs> you've done. You've been doing a lot of trading then. How did you get all those? 
What service were you providing? <laughs> Dodgy, that's it. <coughs> Has everybody paid their tax? I haven't got any leaflings to pay, sorry. So you didn't offer to do any work for the people who got the leaflings? You're destitute. <laughs> Can I have two in two and have an IOU? <laughs> no, the government won't accept this as a roof. Has everybody paid their one Liebling tax? Because John's there ready to, uh, this tax inspector's ready. Uh, yeah, it's three, but I've collected it from two other people. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, can you put your hands up if you've got no money? Right. Can you put your hands up if you've got some money? Right, OK. I'm uh, Bill Clinton. I want the government to balance its books. Because I've actually spent more than I've taxed. Mm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I spent a load of Lieblings and I taxed a lot of them back. But I didn't tax all of them back. I've run a deficit. Mm. I've issued more currency than I've taken back in tax. I've got to balance the books. It's terrible, we must balance the books. So I'm introducing an extra poll tax. Bill Clinton wanted to balance the books, he did. So I'm coming for your extra money. So those of you who've still got Lieblings, you've now got none. And those of you, those of you who had no Lieblings, you're now in debt. Do you get it? Some of you who had spare Lieblings, I've now taken them away from you. I have now got a balanced budget, in fact I've got a surplus because half of you still owe me money for the extra tax that I produced. Mm. So, the, yeah. the, the, I've got money, you haven't got any, there's no money in the economy. If a government tries to balance the books, it will leave no money in the economy. Mm. And that's the exact opposite of what people think. And I've tried to demonstrate it tonight. It's a bit counterintuitive, but I hope that's given you food for thought. So when we talk about spending, we have to understand where the money comes from. The government creates all the money it wants. If it doesn't create enough, you'll have none. But if it creates too much, if I suddenly started handing out tens and tens of money, without a corresponding rise in production. We've got chronic inflation. So the problem with creating money is not we haven't got it. We can always have money, but we can create too much and cause inflation. So that's what we've got to think about with the job guarantee, with the universal basic income. Will it cause inflation? And that, yeah. Those are just some things to think about. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realise I was running beyond schedule. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Steve, thank you very much. Well, we do, have, um, we do have plenty of time for some questions, and I'm sure there will be some. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Aaron's got two hands up already, so okay. and then we'll come to... So, Aaron, off you go. What's your question? In 2008 or something, the Green Party created this fantastic document <coughs> on UBI. It was about 20 pages long. It balanced to zero that the amount of money it would cost would offset by nothing. Uh, I can't find it on the internet anywhere. I've got it somewhere on my laptop, so I can put it down. But it had all the figures, but because of all the, the way it was calculated, you, you weren't paying, so you wouldn't pay, um, you wouldn't have your tax free allowance, for example, on the first £12,000 worth you earned. You, you'd, you'd be taxed on pound one because you'd already got the universal basic basic income as your initial fund. So it all balanced out, um, which is what I was expecting you to say here. But of course, their, their figures they were working on in 2008 was about unemployment benefits, so it wasn't a lot which back then was probably £75 a week. Um, so that's not really a question, it? it's more the state. Mm. But yeah, yeah, so I was expecting to balance out, basically. Yeah, it links into that first figure I gave of £67 billion. Pounds. That was a net amount, and that calculation was done using some of what you've said. You introduce the basic income, and then because of the basic income, other benefits are withdrawn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you get the net cost. They presented something to the Houses of Parliament, and one of the things that was, was, was unfortunate was they, they, for the job guarantee, for one, for one set of proposals, they kept 
giving the gross cost, but for the universal basic income, no, they gave the, the gross cost for the universal basic income, and for another set of proposals, they gave the net cost. So it wasn't a fair comparison. So when you're looking at these costs, it takes ages to work it all out, and it depends what the air. Uh, the other half of that question is, um, what well, the statement is, well, was it saved in COVID? Because people like me who want to work live on the amount of money you get on other things. But people who are in work, who suddenly aren't in work, they are put on universal income. And so oh, we, we can't we can't manage, we need 20 quid a week more than those other people who are managing perfectly fine, because I'm used to running my car and going on holiday and doing all the things. They've got such a high working standard of living that when they come down to the basic, living on the basics, they can't. So how do they manage? Or are you going to give them extra because they were working and now aren't? Well, the universal basic income, if it's introduced universally and not just targeted at the poor, the rich would keep their wealthy jobs and then they just get the basic income in addition. Mm. Yes, but I'm yeah. saying but if you lost your job, if you got fired, if you got sick, whatever it is, you drop from your 30 grand uh, a year down to the basic income of 15 grand and all of a sudden you've still got the same outgoings and the higher mortgage mm. of what you lived on before. Well, if a wealthy person loses their job, they, they have to face some harsh realities, don't they? they do. Universal basic income might make it slightly easier for them, but it's not going to, they're still going to find it a big shock. Yeah. Mm. Okay. They might have to sell one of their cars. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy. What I've not ever understood about universal basic income is the fact that you say it would get rid of the whole department of people who won't have to make judgments on who needs it and who doesn't because everyone will get it. I understand that. But because of the housing situation that's got so out of hand and the fact that even if you had a, a, a minimum wage job and the universal basic income, you then still would have to be, if you're renting, would probably then have to have a means test to see if you could have some extra to get a housing benefit. So how does that link in? I don't well, I think it shows the limitation of a universal basic income in solving the uh, what I would call finance capitalism, whereby the we haven't talked tonight about the private banks. The private banks are authorised by the government to create those lieblings, but they lend them out and they get them back and they charge interest as well. The private banks are... are it's a hot, I'm very, very interested in the housing problem, but it takes quite a long time to talk about it. But basically, yes, the housing problem, that won't be solved by universal basic income. There's causes for the increase so in housing. still will be need for benefit. Yes. Yeah, I just didn't understand. Yes, yes, yes. Is there a book on universal basic income? No, that deals with housing for the universal basic income. There's, there's, there's books... Um, publications by an organisation called Positive Money, by the economist I study with Steve Keane doing economic papers showing that the reason why house prices have gone up is not because so much as there's a shortage of housing, but because the amount of money being created for housing has been greatly increased mm -hmm. and because mm -hmm. a lot of that has gone to people who've already got houses. Steve, Steve, Steve Keane. Keane. Yes. Or positive money. It, it, it's, no, yeah. 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 Uh, Steve at the back. Yeah. Okay. So, um, were you, uh, I guess, were you broadly in favour of the uh, guarantee, job guarantee but over, over the universal basic income? Well, I mean, could, could you have a hybrid solution? Could you have both? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think there's been enough, pi I think it's very difficult to pilot a universal basic income because these partial pilots, mm. that it's not universal. Uh, so I suppose you could, I'm not against pilot, more pilots, but yes, I think the job guarantee is, is, would be my preference. But I'm still researching the job guarantee. The job oh sorry David. You're speaking out of turn, Susan, but I will allow you on this occasion as your special guest from London. So. Um, I'm not thinking of London. The job guarantee you said was a transitional thing. It was when there's a need, and when that need is filled, it could go on to another need, another type of work. Yes. Yeah. So, 
everyone coming this way with basic income, which I think seems a good idea, but that would be on top of it, would it? That would be in conjunction with it. Well, some people want to combine some level of basic income with a level of job guarantee. Most people who want the job guarantee don't want a basic income, they just want to make sure everybody's got a job. And then, as, as in America under the New Deal, when the economy expands, those, those basic income, jo those job guarantee jobs, they disappear. In Argentina, Daniel, uh, they got everybody back to work and then the economy recovered and everybody went back into ordinary jobs and they didn't need those job guaranteed mm -hmm. jobs anymore. They were <coughs> transitional. But if, but you should keep the legislation there so that when the economy contracts then the employer, the, the, the government will step in. Does that, yeah, no. does that address what you're, yes, yeah. Definitely. In Argentina? Yeah, but all the cake bakers oh. and street cleaners have been absorbed into different parts of the economy. I presume there's still a need for cakes and clean streets. But this, this is what I was thinking, you know, how, how do you make sure that the jobs don't compete? Mm. Yeah, mm. but he, Daniel says that they, they managed it. Uh, I suppose the, 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 the full-time state employees cleaning the streets. They kept their jobs, but then these jobs were in addition. That, that's how it works. <coughs> Maybe you had people going around checking rubbish everywhere in order to create the job. No. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, Roger, you've been waiting, and then Chris, I think. Yeah, I just want to say it's a very interesting talk. I pretty much you know, agree with everything you you put that. I, I too would favour the basic income over the universal income. I think they're the way to do it. I do. But I think one, I think you mentioned the EU. I think it's important to also point out. I don't think it's as feasible in many other countries as it would be in this country. Because I don't think every country is now able to create its own currency. For example, in Europe, the currency is created by the central bank not by the governments anymore. I think there are some countries which are linked, they're linking their exchange rate to the US dollar. We can't implement these systems as well because their currency is, goes up and down. That's the problem they've had in Argentina. Because it's so linked so much to, to the US dollar. And what the thoughts are. Well, you've hit upon the, the proponents of the job guarantee, the Bill Mitchells of this world, they say that all these policies can only work in a country which has its own currency mm. Mm. and it mustn't borrow in another country's currency. Mm. So you've hit upon yeah, an important yeah, topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, it's a good point. Uh, Chris, did you... No, okay, yes. Um, so how... So I have two questions for, for UBI and JG. Um, so for UBI, the universal basic income, um, how how do you handle like people choosy people? You know, when you have money, when everyone have money, they they can choose whatever they like, right? And not every job is a dream job. Right? So you you find something like an inequality between jobs that they like and jobs that are available. Um, so how do I handle with that? That's the first question. And the se second question for job guarantee is that, um, just like what you say, um, so the job that created is not, actually, I, I thought that every job has to be something value for, for, um, for, the, for the society. Um, it's like JG is trying to create a job that Maybe it's not well, just like create from 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 scratch from from the thin air something like that, and then um, you know when when you don't need that and it disappear. That's the kind of thing that like it's like I say okay this job is not worth for even exist in the first place. So how how can you handle that? 
Well, what, what they did in, in Argentina and what they've done elsewhere is they work with, with local businesses, local communities, local trade unions, charities, and they say, what in your neighbourhood uh, would be beneficial? What would be nice to have? And then they create, they create those jobs and the state pays them to do those jobs. Uh, so it does require administrative, uh, it does require administrative effort. I can't get back to the page that it was on, but yeah. And what w I didn't fully understand your point about the UBI with choosy jobs. Like, um, you know, um, so, so everyone, you know, there's jobs that like people look up to. Like if they, if they have enough money, they won't take jobs that, you know, like um, there, there's a many jobs that no one, not, not many people want that. Like, yeah. Uh, so, but there, but there a demand for that job. There, there, there a demand for that job. There's a need for the jobs which people don't want. Mm -hmm. But you think that if we give people universal basic income, they will stop doing those yeah. inferior, in mm -hmm. inverted commas, jobs, and mm -hmm. they'll all want to do the nice jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you might be right. But of course, many of the proponents of the UBI, they think that an awful lot of the inferior, in inverted commas, jobs will be done by machines anyway because mm. they, they, they've got you see there's this big contradiction everybody's saying we've got to increase the pension age we need more work we've got a shortage of jobs and then at the same time people are saying oh artificial intelligence is, is, is destroying all our jobs so it's quite clearly that society and economists we're, we're in a state of uh, confusion as to what's actually going on I can't fully answer your question. Uh, I'll, I'll get to, but to, yes, the gentleman there, I think you had a question earlier. Yeah. Going back to the point in relation to um, each individual country having their own currency. Yes. Um, but in the future, will it not be easier and simpler once digital currency became um, the norm, so to speak? Right. Uh, I've, it's interesting you've asked that because at the moment, the central banks in Europe and around the world, they're all talking about creating what they call central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about money is that it's an IOU. Money is always a debit and a credit. Those Lieblings I passed round, they were my, lia my as the government liabilities to you. When you've got them, they're a credit. Now, so central banks are trying to create digital currency, which will be a government IOU. One of the problems with central bank digital currency is they will effectively have a complete monopoly of the money creation situation because at the moment the commercial banks, they also create money like the central bank, but money which has to be repaid in total. The, the banks can't run a deficit like the government can and like the government should. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so some people fear that if they have central bank digital currency, the private banking sector will collapse. So who's going to monitor which firms should be given loans for productive purposes? They fear that it'll be like the Soviet Union used to be, where there's one bank and mm. it's trying to allocate money around the economy. Mm. And it never managed it. It never managed to do it efficiently. So there's all sorts of problems with central bank digital currency, I think. And it's going to be very interesting to see whether it's implemented. Some people think it's a control tool. Some banking experts are really worried that the, the central banks are taking more and more power to themselves. And you know, like in China now, you, you get points. Uh, for whether you've behaved yourself and then they give you the central bank digital currency. Th what you've raised is the topic for a whole talk in its yeah. own right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll book you up. Um, Simon, do, have you still got a question? No. Oh, right, okay. Cathy, uh, and then I will get back to you, Aaron, don't worry. <laughs> well, I'm actually not really on this subject, but I've just got a pet hate and I do think it's the it's a blot on society. I'm not going to move to you. Everyone who is it. Well, they say, you may put it in quotes and there are jobs. But well, I think that's totally unfair to all the people who do those jobs. There's lots of people, especially in lockdown, 
were what you might have said in the Villa jobs, actually essential jobs. And I think by even saying, using that language in any situation, it doesn't help because I think some people really enjoy mm. working in supermarkets. And it's an essential job, it's not an inferior job. <laughs> Most jobs in society are, are not inferior, they're just a different need. And I just think we shouldn't be yeah. even mm. thinking that. I, I agree with you because this UBI, it, it does talk, it talks about work as if it's something that we all hate and that has no dignity. Mm. Whereas, whereas I prefer the job guarantee because the job guarantee believes that it, jobs have dignity. I'll never forget Martin Luther King's speech when, when those, those refuse disposal men were, were, were killed sheltering from the rain when the, when the refuse disposal lorry and he said they had a job they had dignity. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And, I, and but, but to use the word inferior is unfortunate. Perhaps I shouldn't have used it, but I was, I was, I was linking it. But, but some people think like that, you yeah, see. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But can I just slightly add to that? I, when I lived in Banbury, I knew a brilliant Rastafarian, and he cleaned our local park. And he was so proud of it. And what worries me, I can see the job guarantee, but if we then come in to say, oh, we want lots of people to clean the park, when we were talking about that, you know, how do you then keep his pride in doing something when you make sure that the job doesn't compete directly with it. If he's cleaning the park, that, that's his job. And then if there's other parks which aren't being cleaned, then, then you, asked, give, yeah. you give the job guarantee. And that, that's what Daniel was talking about, that you have to educate people on the, on, on the value and dignity of the jobs, yeah. rather than looking at them as things which, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, and then I'll get back to you, Roger. Yeah, on the unfavourable, unpopular jobs uh, area, um, people who are out of work, who are sick, who are retired, who in some way aren't working, can do two hours a week because they haven't got to lose the benefits if they do the work, they haven't got to lose the pension, nothing gets questioned, judged or otherwise. So people who might not like doing 40 hours working in the sewage cleaning blockages, they might like to do one day a week, so they can do that without any issues, and, and that's, that's one of the bonuses. But the question is, the, the Finland thing, so you said that half the people got £500, say, a month on UBI, but the other 500 are going to get £500 a month unemployment benefit. What's the difference? No, I think the UBI is higher than welfare. Okay, right, that's, that's it, okay. Okay, Roger? I was just making another point which just ties into this comment about inferior jobs. Because it, you, you mentioned the phrase bullshit jobs. Because that also includes jobs that don't really add any value in it. In kind of yeah. Like banking and insurance and that kind of stuff. Yes. Really yes. <laughs> 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 so it includes the whole variety of jobs. I, I think so. The okay. David Graeber's bullshit jobs, <coughs> those were not the uh, the, the, the low-paid park cleaning jobs. These are jobs that are paid quite a lot, but the, the people doing them have a feeling that they're worthless. Uh, Adair Turner, you know Adair Turner who used to be in charge of the fan, he said that the, as far as he could see the British financial sector was doing, you know, half the jobs in it were, were socially useless. They, they serve no public purpose. Bullshit jobs. But then that again, that's an interesting topic for a whole <laughs> A whole evening's uh, mm. talk. Mm. Aaron again. Uh, another point, just to say that there were 14 to 20 volunteers for Dawson Humanists who don't get paid. Um, I don't know if you call this a bullshit job, but we all come here <laughs> because we are volunteers. So yeah, we, we don't want to get paid. Well, Guy Standing would be using you as, as arguments in uh, favour of the, well, the universal basic right. income. <laughs> <laughs> Simon. Yes, uh, I think that it's an interesting thing this moves on to, uh, whether actually we have this rigid definition between employed work and volunteering, mm, mm. but actually that that fraying at the edges and universal basic income would seem to mean that a lot of things which are socially useful but are presently not paid or badly paid could become easier to do. And perhaps done by people yes. yes. who are not retired, 
Yeah, alternatively, I can insist that you all pay me 10% of your income so that I get a, you know, get the company jet after all. You know? <laughs> Actually, Simon, that... <laughs> your work is totally useful. <laughs> well... <laughs> the gu guy standing in the UBI people do, do, do talk a lot about the fact that there's, there's a whole lot of work that's done in society that's, that's not paid. Yes, yes. Uh, they, they raise and they talk, yes. talk about it, yes. like, as you've started to do. Susan. I accept it because we don't want to talk about inferior jobs, but we have to acknowledge that there are dreadful jobs that people have to do. You know, as we, we got part of this, they can get pride from it. What? So, Susan, no, give I us... I don't think a lot of people get pride from very, very long hours and, and desperate jobs. I really don't. Cleaning jobs, desperate jobs in hospitals. People enjoy cleaning. Some people do. And if it's... If it's well, we can't argue for if it's stable like that. But I mean, if it, if we know that cleaners in hospitals and various places are very badly paid, and it's not a nice job. I think we need to make a distinction between a job which is unpleasant because you have to do it for 18 hours a day just to make ends meet, mm. the, the exploitative element of the job, and the nature of the job itself. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, mm. if you're getting decently paid to yeah. do 15 hours cleaning a week, yeah. what's wrong with that? But they're not decently paid. No, that's the point, but that, that's, that's, that's the pay and the conditions yeah. rather than the nature of the job, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying, I don't like it. <coughs> calling jobs in figure, but I'm acknowledging that there are terrible jobs people have to do. But I think a lot of the terribleness that you're referring to is the, is the long hours and the rate of pay and the, conditions more, the, and the conditions more than the actual type of job, perhaps. Steve? Yeah. Just a quick one. Um, we've seen that we've got quite a lot of the inferior jobs there. Did, did you really mean just replaceable jobs? You're talking about AI and, and, and sort of automation just replacing certain jobs. Yes, jobs which sort of, well, AI is going to replace. I mean, ro robots and, and machines have replaced sort of mechanical jobs. And now AI is, is replacing jobs which, re which at the moment require a certain degree of thinking. And they're worried that the, the AI will now become more intelligent than us. Yeah. That's why I was making that joke about the Darwin's Darwinian process whereby the humanists are distraught because their own theory of Darwinism means that we're all going to become obsolete because AI will be cleverer than we are and they will be, we will be the species that's <laughs> gone. Roger? Lecturers often say there's no such thing as a stupid question. I don't understand where the money comes from that is paid to the people on universal basic income. Mm. It comes from the, when I gave out the currency a minute ago, yeah. the, the government creates it as a tax credit and it gives it out. I don't know what a tax credit is. A tax, cre a tax credit is, a, is a, a piece of paper or a piece of metal. Or, or any object, a tally stick, which can be used to pay taxes. When you've got it, you can pay your tax with it. So it's a tax credit. I'm not paying a tax, I'm receiving money. Yeah, the, the money you will receive will be a tax credit. If, if, you're, if you're not receiving enough money to pay tax, then you will keep your tax credit. Just, you, you will keep it, so and you'll be able to spend it. Somebody must be creating money. The government is creating the money. It yeah. It. it it doesn't. It can print it. It can put it on a hard drive. It can stamp its the head. Of the, the king's head can be stamped onto a piece of metal, and you get a token. It's it's a it's a tax credit. It can take different physical forms, but it shows that the government has agreed that it will owe you this money, and in return it will allow you to pay your taxes in that money. No, not everybody will have to pay taxes. So some people will get given tax credits by the government, but they won't 
have to pay tax. Not everybody in society has to pay tax. But enough people have to be paying it for the money to be want to be used. Can I just jump in there? Because you won't be paying tax because you'll be eating food, won't you? Sure. You'll be eating food. Yes. And you'll be consuming. Um, I think, I, I'm not an economist, but all the, the, the less money you get, the more money you're actually going to spend. And that will be VAT, which we used to, oh, not just all food, but most things you would actually spend mm. money on. So you will be paying tax, won't you, by spending your money? If, if you get your tax credit, and you don't pay income tax but you buy food with your tax credit and part of that food that you've got the person producing it may have to give a tax credit back to the government which we would call VAT so you're indirectly paying tax back to the government you're assuming that not everybody wants to be on universal basic income you're assuming that some people want to be earning money well, the universal basic income is to give to everybody, but there'll be loads and loads of people still working because it's only a basic income. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a good income. Survival income. Sorry. Survival income. Yes, and of course, it's not been decided how high you set it. And what's the criteria for that? That's the problem. How are we all going to agree on what? It should be said. What should it include? Well, anything about that. well, I suppose in Finland they, get, they, they, they did this figure of 565 a month. It'll be, it'll be more than welfare, but it'll be less than the minimum wage. Well, that doesn't mean anything. What does that credit actually give you in terms of things that you need in life for more? It'll give you more well, things that you'll well, want than if you're on welfare. You agree on whether it's the right amount. The value of different things. Yeah. That's the nature of, of human society. Okay, okay, let's not have a free-for-all because we're, we're nearly out of time. I just want to bring John in. John, you, did you still want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, it's probably related to what's been uh, kicking around now. Is if you, um, what's the, I was wondering what the global implications would be, do you think, of giving working-age people in this country a basic income that would mean, say, well, particularly one in this country, as people suggested. But if they went to live on a beach in Mex Mexico, they could live like a king. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so what's to stop this outflowing of working age people who's going to be left? Well, a, a universal basic income is below the minimum wage, so you wouldn't be able to live on the beach in Mexico for very long. If you were just getting well, well maybe uh, you would. I don't you know. Very well, with less money in other yeah. countries. Yeah. 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 Yes, it was residential. The universal basic income proponents say, yeah, that's a good point. And I remember reading it. You have to be resident. So if you're British but living in France, you don't get universal basic income. Yeah, that was one of their conditions. Okay, we're out of time. Um, Steve, we've got at least three or four more talks, uh, I think, that you've suggested tonight. <laughs> so I think we'll be back. We'll be getting Steve back to do some more of this. Um, I think maybe this has raised possibly more questions than it's answered, which is, which is always very stimulating. So please do stay in the bar and, and uh, chat about this. Um, but meanwhile, please give Steve a big round of applause. For